Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Travis Lewis? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. The Snowden family lived in Horseshoe Lake, Arkansas, which is a small community of about 300 residents. It is about 35 miles southwest of Memphis, Tennessee. The family was well known in the area and in the state of Tennessee, where they had done business and accumulated significant wealth. In 1919, they built an expensive house on Horseshoe Lake, which would become known as Snowden House. Over the years, the house was used for various purposes, for some of the time, it was a bed and breakfast. The house was renovated and expanded to 6,000 square feet. It was described as stately, luxurious, and elegant. It was even featured in the 1994 movie, The Client. A woman named Sally Snowden McKay, who was one of the Snowden family heirs, took over the operations of the house in the 1990s. Sally had three daughters, Grace, Katie, and Martha. The Snowden family owned several houses on Horseshoe Lake in addition to Snowden House. Sally stayed in a cabin on the lake during the time she managed the house. She had a nephew named Lee Baker, who had a wife and three sons. Lee worked for Sally. He handled general maintenance at Snowden House and was responsible for collecting rent from the tenants in other Snowden family properties. One of the families who rented a house from the Snowden family was the Lewis family who had two sons, including a 15-year-old named Travis Lewis. Lee Baker's son spent a lot of time with Travis and his brother. At one point, Travis had tried to cash one of Sally's checks illegally. Later, Travis had stolen some video games from Lee's sons. Lee went to visit the Lewis family, and there he found the video games. Not long after this, Lee Baker's house caught on fire and burned to the ground. Some people believe that Travis was responsible, but nobody could prove it. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On September 10, 1996, a resident of Horseshoe Lake was driving when he saw Sally's red Toyota Camry flipped over on the road. No one was in the vehicle. The resident went to a nearby store. The owner of the store recognized the Camry as belonging to Sally, so the men visited Sally's house to investigate. When the men arrived, they found Lee Baker's white GMC Sierra pickup truck in the carport next to a screen door that had been cut. In addition, they realized the house was on fire. They called 911. Firefighters entered the house and found the partially burned bodies of 75-year-old Sally and 52-year-old Lee. They were able to identify that Sally and Lee had been shot to death. There wasn't a lot of helpful evidence at the scene. There was no murder weapon no spent shell cases. They found a few partial fingerprints, but no DNA. The police had more success in the Toyota Camry. There they found hair on the headliner, fingerprints on the passenger side door, and a palm print on the windshield. One of Lee Baker's sons told the police that he thought Travis Lewis could be the killer. The police went to the high school where Travis attended. They discovered he had been suspended. They located Travis at his home and questioned him. He said that he had been home all day. His mother said the same thing. The police decided to give Travis a so-called polygraph. He supposedly passed the test three times, so the police gave him a fourth test. This one he supposedly failed. Confronted with the magic polygraph results, Travis changed his story. He didn't realize that the results didn't mean anything. Polygraphs are pseudoscience. He said that his mother didn't know he was suspended from school. On September 10, she thought that he was going to school, but instead he rode his bicycle to Lee Baker's house to burglarize it. So he was admitting that he went there to commit a crime. On the trip, he ran into a friend of his named Andre, who decided to join Travis for the burglary. Travis said that Andre was in the possession of a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. After arriving at Lee Baker's house, Andre decided that Travis should break into that house while he broke into Sally's house. So they were each going to burglarize a separate house. 
A few moments later, as Travis was committing the burglary of Lee Baker's house, he saw Andre pull up in Sally's Camry. Andre said to Travis that he just killed two people and needed help disposing of the bodies. Travis went with Andre to Sally's house, but the pair wasn't able to move the bodies because they were too heavy. They decided to set them on fire instead. They backed Lee's truck up to the door to prevent anyone from entering and extinguishing the fire. Travis and Andre drove away in Sally's Camry, but they crashed the vehicle a few miles away. They climbed out and ran away from the vehicle. According to Travis, Andre threw the pistol in Horseshoe Lake. Travis was arrested for robbery. The police then looked into Andre. He denied any involvement. His girlfriend gave him an alibi for September 10. Andre's fingerprints and DNA did not match those found in the vehicle. Travis, however, was a match. His charges were upgraded to capital murder. On April 7, 1998, Travis pleaded guilty to two counts of murder and one count of burglary. For the murders, he was sentenced to 28 and a half years. For the burglary, five years. The sentences were to run concurrently. Travis was eligible for parole after 20 years. Despite pleading guilty, Travis attempted to maintain his innocence, and there were many people who believed him. They thought that he must have been with somebody else during the crimes, and that conspirator was the one who was truly guilty. One of the people supporting Travis was Martha McKay, Sally McKay's daughter. Martha asked the police to reopen the case, which they did, but they didn't find anything that changed their theory of the crime. After the murder of her mother, Martha inherited Snowden House and moved to Arkansas. She spent $100,000 to renovate the house and started operating it as an upscale bed and breakfast. Martha hired Travis's mother to work as a housekeeper, and Martha became pen pals with Travis. They developed an unusually close friendship that seemed like it was a bad idea to many people who knew Martha, mostly because of the part where Travis had killed Martha's mother. To most people, that would certainly represent an impediment to friendship. Martha just couldn't give up this idea that Travis was not as guilty as people thought he was. She firmly held on to this magical theory that there was some more culpable conspirator involved. Travis wasn't the real villain. He just helped burn the bodies and steal the victim's property. In Martha's mind, he was practically an angel. Travis was granted parole in 2018, and Martha gave him a job as a groundskeeper at Snowden House. After over a year without any problems, Martha sold a chandelier that was in the house for $10,000. Inexplicably, she kept the cash in the house. Travis was there the day she sold the chandelier. He saw the transaction. The next day, Martha noticed that the money had made a daring escape. She fired Travis for the theft. This takes us to the early morning hours of March 25, 2020. Travis Lewis made entry into Snowden House through the back door. He bludgeoned and stabbed Martha to death. During the attack, she managed to activate an alarm. The police arrived and entered the house. They heard footsteps on the second floor and could smell a flammable liquid. After they went upstairs, they found a pile of clothes soaked in this liquid. Martha's body was wrapped in the clothes. The police also noticed a bloody utility knife and a bag full of jewelry not far from the body. The police heard Travis in the bathroom. They ordered him to exit, which he did, but not in the way that they expected. He jumped out of the window and ran to his vehicle. Travis attempted to drive away, but the vehicle became stuck in the front yard. He exited the vehicle and jumped into the lake. He went under the water and never surfaced. His body was later found. There was methamphetamine, cocaine, and marijuana in his system. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. There is little question that Travis was guilty of killing Martha McKay. I think it's fairly clear that he murdered Sally McKay and Lee Baker as well. A witness saw two black males speeding away from Sally's house in her vehicle on the morning of September 10, but no one else's fingerprints or DNA were found in the vehicle. I think Travis was probably working alone, and the witness simply made a mistake. I also believe his intent was to murder Sally and Lee. If it was Travis who set the fire, 
that burned Lee's house down prior to the murders, it stands to reason that he wanted to finish the job. He probably broke into Lee's house with the intent of shooting him, then realized that Lee was over at Sally's house. He then entered her house and killed both of them. This brings me to item number two. I think the murder of Martha McKay was premeditated, just like the double murder. Martha's homicide fit the same pattern observed with the double murder. Travis was angry. He wanted to be able to steal money and buy drugs without people trying to stop him. Therefore, he decided to kill her. The fact that she had been compassionate toward him meant absolutely nothing. If anything, he probably felt as though this justified the murder, like she was unwise for ever being kind to him or trusting him in the first place. This brings me to the final item, number three. Martha McKay was the only member of the Snowden family who supported Travis Lewis. She worked diligently to get him released. She wrote to him in prison. She gave him a job after he was released. Travis had literally murdered her mother, yet she believed it was her spiritual obligation to forgive him. The problem here is that Travis never changed. He appears to have been psychopathic. He had no empathy. He was deceptive, callous, impulsive, and irresponsible. Sometimes people believe that they can change these psychopathic characteristics in criminal offenders. Like Martha looked at Travis and thought, okay, he is a killer, whether he had a conspirator or not, but if I'm nice to him, if I forgive him, if I show him compassion, he will magically change into an entirely different, non-homicidal person. It's one thing to believe that people can change. Sometimes they can. It's also one thing to forgive and to show compassion. But Martha went a step further. She trusted Travis. That was her key mistake. When she finally realized that Travis was bad news, she fired him, but did not seem to appreciate how dangerous he really was. She recorded his theft of the $10,000 in a secret diary, but never reported Travis to the police. Even after his betrayal, she still believed in a world where Travis did not have to suffer consequences for his behavior. When referencing the overabundance of compassion, people sometimes use the phrase, kill them with kindness. On occasion, this lethal force can direct itself back to its owner. Those are my thoughts on the case of Travis Lewis. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.